The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, my name is Mike Willette with the National Native Network, a program of the Inter-Tribal Council of Michigan. Welcome to the NNN webinar series on cancer risk reduction in Indian Country. This webinar is titled Pediatric Obesity, Type 2 Diabetes and Its Influence on Adult Health and Cancer Risks. This technical assistance webinar is being hosted by the National Native Network with the Indian Health Service Health Promotion and Disease Prevention, which offers technical assistance and resources for commercial tobacco and cancer prevention and control throughout Indian Country and the Indian Health Service Clinical Support Center. Your presenters today are Shelley Kubak an MA and BS in public, uh, public Health Consultant with the Michigan Public Health Institute Center for Healthy Communities. In 1989, she earned her uh, public health education and health promotion from Central Michigan University. And Michelle Schulte, MA from... Uh, the Intertribal Council of Michigan, a project director. In 2008, she earned her master's in curriculum and instruction from Blake Superior State University in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. And Beth Seeloff, an MPH, a registered yoga teacher. Um, she is the chronic disease program manager with the Intertribal Council of Michigan. In 2018, she earned her MPH. Uh, as a health educator in health promotion from Grand Valley State University in Grand Rapids, Michigan. We're pleased to offer continuing education credits for participants in this webinar. No commercial interest support was used to fund this activity. This activity is designated one contact hour for nurses and physicians. And to obtain a certificate of continuing education, you must be registered for the course, participate in the webinar in its entirety, and submit a completed post-webinar survey. Post-webinar surveys will be sent out automatically from GoToWebinar within 24 hours of the presentation. By the end of this webinar, participants will be able to examine national recommendations for management of pediatric obesity in American Indian communities and the relationship with type 2 diabetes and other significant health-related diseases that are diagnosed in adulthood. Integrate appropriate diagnostic coding and patient referral strategies to support efforts that decrease type 2 diabetes and related diseases in children and adults. Adults, formulate strategies that support systems change and integrate culturally appropriate education resources and tools for primary care providers in communities. If you have any questions, please type your questions into the question box on the lower right hand side of your screen. Questions will be answered during the last few minutes of this webinar. And now at this time, I am going to throw it to Michelle Schulte in just a second. And Michelle, you should have control of the presentation. All right. Hello, everyone. I'm glad that you all can join us today. Just to give you a little bit of background about why we're here, um, we have been working on a food access collaborative project here with several tribes in Michigan. And one of the things we found out as we started tracking BMI rates for young children ages uh, 2 to 11 was that um, a lot of our health systems, our health clinics, were not consistently tracking BMI rates. And if they were, there wasn't a lot going on as far as referrals. Uh, when we talked to our physicians, they felt like they didn't have enough educational background in pediatric obesity to really be able to speak, and, and they didn't know much about the programs that were available in the community to make referrals, and they lacked the talking points to be able to speak with families on, on how to deal with this, with this 
what's become an epidemic. And so we've kind of taken a step back and pulled together some information that physicians here in Michigan have been asking for. And we've started to present this, what, what you'll see here today to a lot of the health centers. So we hope that this information will also be thought provoking and helpful for you. There are a number of resources that are in here. Um, and so just to set the tone, um, we want to have you kind of think about how we screen for nutritional risks when a patient's at risk. So part of this collaboration is with the, the Three Fires Comp Cancer Program to improve colorectal cancer screening rates in tribal communities. A lot of us will take cancer screening seriously. We know that you know if, if cancer isn't screened quick enough, it can lead to an early death. But do we ever think about that connection to cancer and nutrition, obesity, and even being overweight as a young person? So think about that for yourself. How seriously are you taking it in your clinics? And there we go. And Mike, is there there should be a video, quick short minute video. If all of you are on your on on your head on a, a telephone listening in through telephone and have a computer, if you have the volume muted on your computer, you might want to turn that up. We have a quick video here to give you some of that background information. Go ahead, Mike, you can play the video. Beth. Okay, thank you. My name is Beth. And as you could see from the video, the video addressed um, that there are 13 types of cancer linked to overweight and obesity. And currently, more than 600,000 people in the United States are diagnosed with a cancer related to overweight and obesity. Um, individuals who are obese often have increased blood levels of insulin and insulin like growth factor. I, IGF-1. This condition known as hyperinsulinemia or insulin resistance precedes the development of type 2 diabetes and high levels of insulin and IGF-1 often promote the development of colorectal, kidney, prostate, and endometrial cancers. Next slide. Next slide, please. Uh, PDO, as um, we're going to introduce here and further follow on, is a pediatric obesity health risk span beyond childhood and into adolescence and adulthood. It has consequences for health and well-being, both during childhood and also later in adult life. And as Lancet Public Health published just recently in February, uh, the obesity epidemic over the past 40 years younger generations worldwide are experiencing an earlier and longer lasting exposure to excess adiposity over their lifetime than previous generations. And actually this is resulting in a shorter lifespan. Next slide. And what we'd like to address here in, in continuing this discussion 
is how the uh, tribal health system is an influencer in tribal community systems. So the chronic care model um, in this uh, presentation addresses pediatric, adolescent, and adult, adult obesity in tribal communities. As primary care providers, we want to reintroduce the chronic care model to tribal health systems and tribal governments. Tribal health care staff, along with community leaders, can have a positive influence on community health outcomes with collaboration and proactive community partners. Next slide, Shelley. Hello, this is Shelley. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining in our conversation today. This particular slide shows a diagram and it indicates how childhood obesity can affect a person throughout their entire lifespan. So when we take a look at the arrows, you can see that obesity can begin in childhood, travel through adolescence, and then on into adulthood. And it's not just affecting physical manifestations, but also psychosocial. For instance, if you look at the one piece where it says childhood obesity, and then in adolescence, you might see a low self-esteem, and that might lead to coping mechanisms such as substance abuse, isolation, et cetera. And then on into adulthood, you might see psychosocial problems as well. So it's not just physical, it's also psychosocial. So the takeaway here is what we wanna do is not only providers, community members, public health, schools, is we want to focus on empowering, empowering our youth on living healthy lifestyles early on so that behaviors will stick and carry on into adulthood. And this not only will have a positive impact on their life, but also the communities as a whole. Next slide. Michelle, are you on mute? Oh, sorry, everyone. <laughs> so this report here, this, this data actually came from a larger report called the State of Obesity. And at the end of this slide deck will be a number of resources that if you would like to look at this information in greater detail, will you'll have the full a copy of the full report that you can you can follow a link to. But looking at this data, it shows a long-term plateau in the rates of obesity among American Indians and Alaskan Native children, um, a population with disproportionately high obesity rates. So according to this study, to date on overweight and obesity among this population, 18.5% of children ages 2 to 19 were overweight, and 29.7% were obese in 2015. These rates have held pretty steady since 2006, and we are now seeing those, those changes in the rates again, which is a little alarming. If we look at the patterns of age ranges, our, our, so the ITCMI, that's the Intertribal Council of Michigan, that's data that's specific to uh, the Head Start programs that we help manage and facilitate, and then we compare that to general state data, the Michigan WIC data, um, you can see the, the, the difference in the numbers there. And then you see again, the rates of US Native American students ages two to 19 are spiked again. So when you dig into that data, you have a spike in high obese rates in three to five year olds, it goes down for a little bit and then goes back up into adolescence. Um, in, in our tribal data and our intertribal council of data, our Head Start program showed that only 41% of the Head Start participants ages uh, three to five had healthy BMI weight. So that's, that's pretty significant. And there are a number of reasons for this, which we're addressing through our programs, and I'd love to talk more on here, but for the sake of time, we'll move on to the next slide, where you can see how these obese rates uh, that are related to cancers themselves are also on the rise. Beth, would you like to add more? So, um, yeah, so as you can see, uh, the breast cancer rates are um, extremely high, and that's often due to um, the high sugar content and mimicking estrogen on the cell's estrogen receptors. And most notable is um, the state of obesity report that just came out 
in uh, November of 2018 and early 19 identifies that 150,000 um, obesity-related cancers were recorded in 2010, and they're estimating by 2030 that they're gonna, it's gonna approach 400,000 um, obesity-related cancers across the United States. Next slide. So I think the important message here is that we need to let the communities know that we can prevent more cancer now when kids are younger. And one way to do that is to work on intervention and prevention of obesity and overweight issues that, that we're facing. Okay, next slide. I think I've lost control. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I don't have controls. Mike, are you there? There we go. Thank you. So as we've been discussing, and unbeknownst to many, disp disparities from obesity are not limited to hypertension and diabetes. Obesity increases risk for cancer. And this slide demonstrates the influence of hyperglyce that hyperglycemia has on inflammation. And then furthermore, inflammation's influence on cancer and other complications due to diabetes. So these common environmental or genetic risk factors, you know, um, for diabetes, um, also include, right, uh, nutrition factors um, and eating habits. And, you know, it begins in, when a child is young and proceeds to their adulthood. So these learned behaviors um, have a great influence on these adult cancer risks. Next slide, please. Shelly? Yes, thank you. So this slide refers to current data we have just learned about, which is quite substantial, that there is an increase in cancer in younger adults, ages 25 to 49. And in addition to that, one half of these cancers are obesity related. So more specifically, those six obesity related cancers that match this data is multiple myeloma, colorectal, gallbladder, kidney, pancreatic, and uterine. So because this data is so significant, they have now labeled this a public health issue. Next slide, please. So this slide talks about type two diabetes, colorectal cancer specifically, and the obesity connection. So if you look at all of the boxes in there, it gives some specific data that's quite interesting. And recently, some studies have shown that there's a positive association between type 2 diabetes, colorectal cancer, and obesity. And the new data has also shown that the population is increasingly getting younger in colorectal cancer diagnosis. And it's also estimated to be 20% higher in patients with type 2 diabetes than non-diabetic patients. And it also appears to have worse outcomes when diagnosed if you have type 2 diabetes and you're diagnosed with colorectal cancer. And one of the connections that they feel that's playing a role in this connection, some of them are insulin resistance, hyperinsulinemia, increased levels of IGF, elevated levels of steroid and peptide hormones, and inflammatory markers. These are some of the things that they're looking at that might be creating that connection. One of them, on a brighter note today, there's newer therapies that are being um, designed targeting insulin and IGF systems that they're being developed for use in cancer therapies. So if you look at all of the boxes, it'll give you some more detailed information. Next slide, please. And this slide basically reviews some other significant health-related diseases diagnosed in adulthood, and that's also related to obesity. So in review, if we focus on addressing pediatric obesity as early as possible, this will help mitigate health-related chronic diseases diagnosed in adulthood. And it's vital right now that everyone be focusing on, on that so that we can prevent some of these disparities through adolescence and into adulthood. Next slide, please. 
So our discussion has turned with a lot of our tribal health centers in looking at screening protocols for overweight and obesity. Um, you know, when we think about the implications of the cost of cancer and diabetes on, on all of our health systems, there's significant costs that can be saved but through prevention. The, there is some com conflicting guidance, though, in the recommendations for screening protocols. Our tribal health systems typically fall under the U.S. Preventative Task Force task force screening guidelines um, and and often we can get reimbursed for those screenings but largely our health centers are are unaware of how to do that and we've been talking to them a lot about the icd-9 codes icd-10 codes there are nutrition screening codes food insecurity codes that that a lot of tribal health systems are unaware of so um, hopefully all of you, um, if you're not aware of them, we have some information embedded into the PowerPoint that we can share with you all. But but you can, there are num a number of codes that you can be reimbursed for. Um, and we've been doing a little bit of, of work into that. And I think through Medicare and Meta, um, through the through the Medicaid system, you can, you uh, an individual can be screened, can have up to three screenings reimbursed per day. So um, we really invite people to look at um, these guidelines and then to look at your ICD, what ICD codes you're, you're using and see what the, what's available to you. Oops, sorry. My screen is stuck again, Mike. This slide addresses some of the CDC guidelines for type 2 diabetes. And then if we go to the next line, you can see some of the strategies that go along with that. There we go. And these are CDC recommended strategies. So um, a lot of our tribal folks were really, were really working on, on two levels. We're working on the system level to improve the, the clinic, at the clinical setting, the education of our providers, access to the types of referrals that they could be making and then we're applying those with a number of outreach activities so there are several grant programs that we're trying to work get to work together we have a number of communities that have tribal farms uh, with their own farmers markets that we can provide vouchers or nutrition prescriptions for we have um, you know looking at working with food pantries and our commodity food programs to reduce the number of sugar sugary type snacks or you know unhealthful snacks that might be available to the community and through our home visiting and healthy start program we've really ramped up the breastfeeding initiative and duration that that families are are breastfeeding for um, and then decreasing screen viewing so we're really trying to put messages out there to community that you know let's get active let's get moving next slide So as, so as Michelle has discussed, you can see that building health strategies around the chronic health model can expand beyond the health center. It involves all aspects of the communities and tribal governments. And um, these are some examples of community programs and policy um, to include use of diagnostic, code, uh, diagnostic and procedure codes for increasing screenings support referrals and financial revenues for the clinic. So it takes a community to improve tribal community health outcomes. And tribal community health comes, outcomes can be influenced through these screenings, um, through appropriate billing, and gaining revenues for the clinic and the community at large. Next slide. Michelle? So this, this slide offers you an opportunity to look into some of those toolkits, some of those resources that we talked about. One of the ones that is a, has been of particular interest to a lot of our folks has been the food insecurity kit, which is that first one. When you get a copy of this, this slide deck, we invite you to follow that link, link and take a look at it. Um, food insecurity screening is one that is is very underused in a lot of our in a lot of our communities here in Michigan, um, but it's basically two questions, just two simple questions you can ask 
which can open up the door for um, some reimbursable referrals and interventions that you can kind of tie into your system. Um, any of you that are living in a rural food access area, there is a toolkit there with some great ideas and strategies which we've borrowed and have been using pretty successfully. Um, if you'd like to know more about the chronic care management tool that we were we shared here in this site, there is a toolkit there and then CCM management toolkit, which offers some more implementation and strategies that might be helpful for your programs. There we go. Um, it's, it's also been success, suggested that overweight and obesity reductions can occur, can accrue if the prevention focus is shifted to promoting healthy lifestyles and healthy environments beyond the focus of the individual. So we need to look at the whole family and we need to look, you know, not just at the children, the bodies, the, the child body weight as an outcome, but we need to look at what are some of those issues that the family is struggling with. Because usually if a child is overweight, then the family's going to be in the same boat. The, the child doesn't get to choose its, his or her foods that they're eating. So we need to work on the whole family. Um, so let's look at healthy options that we can give to families. I think a lot of our physicians need to think beyond just telling the parents that, you know, you need to be active for 30 minutes a day or work towards an hour a day, turn off the television. Let's give them something more specific. Um, where can they get the healthy options for food that's affordable to them? Where are there programs that they can, you know, take advantage of whole family physical activity? There's so many activities that might be just for the kids, and if they have kids of multiple ages, or there's activities that might be just for adults, but where are there activities that families can go together and be healthy and active? Okay, and the next slide. These again are some of the strategies that we've been working on, the outreach strategies that we've been working on in our tribal communities. We've, we've implemented a number of cooking classes, cooking kitchens for youth and families. We, some of the, the really fun activities have been the nutrition prescriptions. So we have a couple tribes that are doing these, taking these a little bit different. Um, one particular community has a tribal farm that throughout the season, they'll take their extra fruits and vegetables, put it into like a CSA box or a community box where they'll have the box up fruits and vegetables. And so when families come into the clinic, they get, they each get one of these fruits and veggie boxes to bring home. And then they can have recipes in there that they can try new things um, and then kind of report back. And for the other tribes, uh, they do things a little bit different. So their nutrition prescription involves vouchers that they give to either the local meat market or to the farmer's market, and then families can try different fruits and vegetables um, and then also be, take part in cooking classes. Um, a lot of the community gardens, especially the tribal gardens and farms, allow for community members to come and pick for free fruits and vegetables that they can take home. So we've been really trying to collaborate across different programs and different departments to increase that access to food. We did a community assessment profile, which can be shared with anyone on the call if you want to email me afterwards, um, that this, this profile kind of looked at where are all the food access points in the community and, and what is the quality of food there. So we, we had an opportunity to talk to convenience store owners and even some big commercial chains and see how they're promoting fruits and vegetables. Where are these things offered? You know, we, we know that the snacks are right there at the counter, the chocolates and all the candies are available. Let, but let's shift a little bit and try to make those fruits and vegetables at the forefront. Um, a lot of our store owners at the beginning of this said, you know, we'd love to be able to promote that. However, we don't know how to package it. We don't have coolers for this and that. So we're still working on that aspect of it, but those are just some of the easy little fixes that can, bring that helpful message out into the community. Um, some other policy things that have been really um, kind of a neat incentive for families is fitness leave. Some of the tribes will offer an extra half hour onto either lunch hour if they're taking advantage of, you know, getting healthy themselves. <clears throat> Next slide. So another part of the work that we've been doing is trying to increase the number of resources that our providers have available to them. I just wanted to share this 
the Nutrition Care Manual is an online subscription that, that you can purchase um, fairly inexpensively. One of our tribes in the, has actually used this as part of their pediatric obesity protocols there right in their center. So a physician might be upstairs working with a patient who has an issue with diabetes and being overweight and they really need to lose weight. So our physicians can go into this system. There are handouts. There's um, reference to certain types of diet and menu plans for the um, individual. And then it also pairs that up with talking points and ICD codes that can be related to um, what needs to be done for the next steps. What the physician will then do is go into the system, pick out a couple of those areas that are pertinent to that to that individual, call down to the dietitian and say, before this patient leaves, I'm sending them down to you. Please have these handouts ready or have these talking points ready for them. The dietitian can go right into the system, pull out exactly the same thing the physician's talking about and be on the way. And then also, um, you know, as you know, with some of our referrals, it's difficult for families to have transportation. So if we don't catch them on that day, it's it's really hard to, to follow up sometimes. So this is one of those tools that we've been using that, that is found to be <clears throat> pretty valuable for some of our communities. Now we have another short video here. This is another resource that a lot of our communities are interested in. Um, Cognito is another online resource that has a number of tutorials. They cover a number of different kinds of issues, including bullying. Um, but the one that we've been using in this project is one called Change Talk, uh, Childhood Obesity. It, provided, it, provides, pro, it provides our health, our health um, staff with talking points that they've been asking for. How do I talk to a family about these sensitive issues around obesity? And I've seen it used in a couple of different ways. There are some clinics who the doctors have gone in, taken the tutorials, and then have those talking points themselves. They know how to address different things that the families might say. And for other clinics, they have access to iPads. Sometimes our home visitors will have used this, and they have iPads that they'll bring home for their appointments. And then the families can kind of go through this tutorial themselves. So there, it almost works like a little SIM-type program. Uh, Mike, if you could play the video for this, we'll show just a quick trailer on this one as well.
that some of our tribal health sites have found really helpful. Um, in addition to that, I'm just going to run through a number of other slides of different resources that we've used. And again, we're not promoting one over another. There's a number out there. These are just some of the things that we've done. And sometimes, you know, seeing something can spark an idea for yourself or lead to other digging that you might do to find something that will work for your center and your community. Okay, Mike, next slide. Many of you, if you've worked with tribal communities, may have seen these, the My Plates, My Native Plate, My Power Plate. Those are great resources. Not every center is, is aware of them, and they're free resources that you can get online just through ordering in uh, the USDA system or IHS even has links, I think, to some of these. Next slide. <clears throat> Valerie Seagrass has done a lot of work through, and, and Elise Crone have done a lot of work and actually has been, they have been featured on NNN, previous NNN webinars. The resources that they have available have been really helpful to a lot of our folks um, and have been inspiration to some of our outreach programs, such as smoothie making classes and getting kids to try new foods. So, I mean, inspiration can come from anywhere. And there are some great Native American specific <clears throat> things out there that you can take advantage of. Next slide. More resources here. These were some of the other freebies that you can look for. Next slide. Um, so this is kind of a nice little, uh, another nice resource that we've, that we've come across. The Healthy Food Playbook actually has, if you go to the next slide, Mike, <clears throat> it has a number of strategies, especially the outreach strategies listed right here. When you go, when you go to the Playbook website, you'll see this, this screen like this that has 16 different strategies listed to it. And it'll have actual community programs that you can take a look at and see what they're doing. So that has been a big help as we started our collaborative process and tried to expand it to the next to the next um, to the next level. Next slide. And as we're coming towards the end of the presentation here, you can see that we have a list of other resources that we've cited throughout the project or throughout this presentation that you can go back into and read a little bit more on. And Beth or Shelley, did you have anything else you wanted to add there? Not, not here, no. Okay, so I just wanna open it up to questions, if anybody has any questions. And then before we leave today, I'll have a question of all of you that we hope that you can contribute through the question box or the chat box. But let's first ask if anybody in the audience has any questions for us. Okay, and we did have uh, one question. Um, if you do have a question, uh, please enter your uh, questions into the chat box, or into the question box, I'm sorry, the question box on the lower right hand side of your screen. Um, this person says, I'm just wondering if tribes in Indian country are working on a sales tax for junk food, such as soda pop tax, etc. And also, did your tribal council support it or push you aside? I am interested and hope to get some ideas. So in Michigan, do not get involved in taxes. That's something that, um, you know, that's, that's kind of, you know, kind of how we need to be creative. We, we typically don't, um, we, we don't get into charging for taxes for, for things on the reservation. I don't know if it's different in other, in other communities, but in Michigan, we, we stay away from that. It's an ideal thing to do if we were off reservation, but on reservation, we're not allowed to do that. Um, and then this person says, uh, can you all explain fitness leave a bit more? Is that just for staff? I can discuss that. So, if you oh, want. Go ahead, Beth. So fitness leave is a negotiated benefit through um, the tribal HR systems. And it's very similar to the federal government system where um, they usually allow either 30 to 45 minutes in conjunction with the lunch hour um, during the day. And so that is something that can be presented to your tribal HR 
and or your tribal council. But that is um, a negotiated leave system that is um, provided to tribal government employees. Um, usually if it is adopted by the tribe, it is, um, it is available to all employees provided that um, their work site can um, accommodate the absence before or after the lunch hour. And there is um, data and it is available to show that these um, fitness leave periods um, in, in conjunction with the lunch periods do improve the overall health of the um, workplace. Did you have anything to add on that, Michelle or Shelley? Um, I'd like to add one thing. A neat program that actually was out in Arizona in the tribal communities is um, they had the fitness leave program. And in addition to that, they actually incorporated, and this was at the a hospital clinic setting, a volleyball court and a basketball court right in the back of the hospital. So staff were able to also um, engage in those types of activities too. It was just a nice little um, added addition to just the workout room. So that's an idea if anybody can incorporate that. Okay. Next question. Um, this person says that uh, the Navajo Nation has junk food tax, which the funds received from this program is given back to the local chapter house. So that's just a comment on that. Um, this other person had a comment and they say, uh, just to share, we have a state employees in, we, we have as state employees in Tennessee, we are permitted to take 30 minute, a 30 minute wellness break, which can't be used in conjunction with lunch, but as a separate break period. So those are just some other options. Um, this person asks, do you have a list of access practical recipes for both children and adults? A list of practical recipes? Is that what? Yeah, a list to access practical recipes for both children and adults. Um, I think we have a list of different resources that you can look at, like recipe books, but we don't have specific lists of just recipes for adults. Um, a lot of our different providers, whether that be our home visitors going into the homes, our dietitians or nurses, we've, we've We've armed them with a number of different books that are out there on the market for purchase that, you know, they go into the recipe books and whatever is close to what, you know, our indigenous diet is here in this region. Um, I think NNN on the website has, Mike, help me out, has a PDF of some of those books that we're using as reference. There's some decolonizing diet books and actually recipe yeah, books from all over we, the, the state, yeah, right? There's a full presentation on um, decolonizing diet um, under the uh, webinar archives tab at keepitsacred.org at our website. Um, there, there is uh, presentations and more information about that. Um, then this next person has a question here. How do you engage your partners or clinical staff? In what ways did you provide tools like Cognito to them? That's a great question. And that's, that's kind of the focus of a lot of the work that we've been doing. I mean, a lot of the system change really relies on us working together and breaking down those barriers. The biggest part of that has really been in the communications. Um, so through Intertribal Council of Michigan, we are not directly embedded into the tribes themselves, but we are a consortium of all the tribes. So one of the first steps in setting up this collaboration and being able to communicate these things are looking for the leadership groups. In the state of Michigan, um, our tribal council leaders get together on a quarterly basis. And so we attend those meetings and just give quick five to 10 minute updates on, you know, either asking them, what are your priorities and what are your needs? Or we come to them and say, okay, we hear from the community that health is a concern or obesity is a concern how do you propose, propose that we address that? And from their directive, then we also have all of our tribal health directors that get together on a quarterly basis. Our education directors get together, Head Start directors get together, um, and even our 
home visiting and Healthy Start staff get together on a regular basis or have once a month call call-ins with each other across different tribes. So that's been hugely um, valuable to being able to network across programs. So at least once a month or at least on a quarterly basis, we're meeting with some key stakeholders in each of these positions and able to talk to them about what do you have going on? Where are your disparities? Here's what another department in your same community is doing. Let's get you guys talking together. Um, it's, it's always amazing to, you know, sometimes that little bit of help from the outside looking in um, can open up those doors. Um, if, you know, if you're one community looking for how do I break down these silos, it's just kind of reaching out and being creative. Like, who who aren't we talking to right now? Like, we know that we need more physical activity. Well, who are programs that naturally would be providing that? What use services are there? So it's just making those simple phone calls. Um, a lot of times when I'm starting a new project, I also look out of the tribal community with who's out there doing the same kind of work that we can. And a lot of it is just cold calls and building those relationships and finding out, you know, where are we doing the same kind of work? Where can we help each other out? Um, from that, those simple co communications, one of the things that we've heard from folks is that the events and activities that they've, you know, been pulling together have been um, m more well attended because the word's getting out. You know, there were so many times in a lot of our health programs we put all this time and energy into doing a family event or a community event, and then nobody shows up. And we're seeing that shift now working across departments that way. But it takes that extra few minutes to make that phone call with another department or another leader in our community to say, hey, what are you working on right now that um, kind of goes along with what we're working on? Or, you know, what do you have as far as health? What, what's your focus in health right now that it might intersect with what we're doing? Okay. And uh, again, we do have plenty of resources up on our website. Um, and then folks have mentioned that they've had a hard time um, downloading the uh, handout um, from GoToWebinar um, within the next uh, 24 hours. And honestly, probably within the next hour or so, we'll have the uh, full archived webinar, including the handouts, um, available on our website at keepitsacred.org. So just kind of keep an eye on that over the next uh, 24 hours or so. Um, this next person just had a comment. Um, we use the SDPI funds for obesity and DMTY2 children's to give incentives to benefit physical exercise for the child and or for the family. Example, volleyball set for the child and siblings and a single child uh, punching bag that were specific to the child's interests. It worked with reducing BMI and lowering A1C. Um, That's a great idea. This other person uh, had a comment saying that the Nevo Nation tried to pass a comprehensive tax bill, but had to break it up first by passing an elimination of taxes for healthy foods, and that was followed by a tax increase for sugary and sweetened beverages. Those documents are available on their tribal website if anyone is interested in the tribal legislation and language for the code and tax structure. Um, this other person made mention that they have found many food bank websites or extension services have very practical, inexpensive recipes, even for free programs can utilize for cooking classes, etc. So, um, I don't know, Michelle, did you want to move on to your uh, next uh, phase here? Yep, please, last, state, last slide if you would. Okay, so every person from the greeter at the tribal clinic to the provider to the bill, biller plays an important role in this work that we're doing. Um, it's not just about the families, it's about the, everybody who, is, who the family is going to touch or see or be influenced by or, or motivated by. Um, so, so everybody's input is valuable. So a big part of these trainings that we've been doing and the, the collaborative work we've been doing is trying to reach out and get everybody to the table, every position, even if they think that that's not something that's of interest to them. Um, if everybody's carrying the same message, it trickles down, especially in our tribal communities where families are running these centers and these clinics and they go home to their families. 
elders play an important part of this too in carrying that message. So um, one of the things I would like to leave here today, but also um, if you're willing to share is just if you could share in the question box some of your thoughts on how what you've heard today and how you might use that to improve your own system of care in your community. What little change just based on anything that you heard here today could could be something that you might look into, whether it be digging into more resources or reaching out to somebody else. Where are those impacts? Where, where are those impacts going to take place? And then if you also want to add in the question box, because, you know, this is ongoing work for us, and this is only the first in a series that we've been asked to do by our tribal clinics. Um, we've already had requests to do other things. If there's other specific questions that came up during this webinar that either we didn't go deep enough into or, you know, as you were thinking about the implications of something we've said and to another question, also write those questions in there. And between the three of us, we'd really like to dig into them and um, hopefully, you know, as long as we have everybody's email information, we'll, we'll be able to answer those and send out another, um, another reply. Um, this person says, I appreciate more resources provided by your presentation. Um, this person says, Squaxin Island Tribe, um, I apologize if I mispronounced that, is currently providing an annual program covering prevent type 2 diabetes curriculum from the CDC. The, com the comprehensive cancer program helps fund this class by pairing cancer fighting ed educational resources to participants. And then this uh, last person says that um, she would like to figure out how to share the interactive provider tool. All right. Yeah. So if there's no other questions about the presentation today, I think we can wrap that up. But Mike, if you wouldn't mind leaving the presentation on for a few more minutes so people could submit their thoughts and additional questions. Absolutely. Yep. That would be helpful. Yeah. Yep. So we'll go ahead and uh, leave the presentation on probably um, up until the top of the hour. So about uh, seven more minutes. Um, and then it'll be a four o'clock Eastern time. Um, we can go ahead and leave it open. So if anybody has any other comments or questions, go ahead and drop them into the question box and then we can uh, document those. Um, also, um, in order to get your continuing education units, um, please be sure to check your email. Um, there should be an email blast going out tomorrow that will have a link to um, SurveyMonkey to complete the evaluation. Make sure at the end of the evaluation to uh, fill out the form, leaving your uh, name and contact information. And uh, we can go ahead and um, get the, get the uh, certificates processed um, within the next six weeks or so. Um, and then if there's anybody that you would like to share the uh, webinar with, um, feel free to uh, visit our website at keepitsacred.org. Also, we are going to have a webinar coming up uh, this Friday uh, talking about um, tribal sovereignty and e-cigarettes and the e-cigarette industry. So um, that uh, information is on um, our social media, on our Facebook page, and it is also at keepitsacred.org under the events tab. So um, feel free to sign up for that webinar tomorrow. Otherwise, as I mentioned, um, go ahead and uh, type in any other additional comments you may have in the question bar. And uh, I think um, with that, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Right, Michelle? Yep, sounds great. Thank you, everyone, for your participation. We really, really appreciate it. And like Mike said, please continue to leave your questions, leave your ideas and thoughts, and we'll try to summarize those and send out a, another blast afterwards for you all to review and kind of continue to share. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you.